Hello, and thank you for joining us for the virtual statewide overview and introduction to the Individual Artist Awards. It was so lovely to see all the messages of love and art and community coming through the chat. I'll just share one I read. I wanted to read them all. Art is what makes us whole. It is such a lovely way to start off our time together today. And tonight, people have joined us from all across Alaska, and we are so glad to share this time and virtual space with each and every one of you. Before we get started, we want to ground you in place. So please take a moment to plant your feet firmly, let your shoulders drop, close your eyes, and listen to the sounds around you. We acknowledge the Alaska Native Nations upon whose ancestral lands we reside. Here in Anchorage, the Rasmussen Foundation sits on the, on the traditional homeland of the Denina Eklutna. We acknowledge that Denina peoples have been the stewards of the land on which we work and reside since time immemorial, and we are grateful for that stewardship and incredible care. Please feel free to introduce yourself if you haven't already in the chat and share where you are joining in from tonight. My name is Enzina Murari, and I am a program officer with the Frasmussen Foundation, and I have the good fortune of working on the Individual Artist Awards. And I'm joined tonight by my fabulous colleagues who I will ask to wave as I introduce them. Lisa Diemer, Zuli Mason, and Karen Lowell. Thank you all so much for your work and for being here tonight. We also want to give thanks to the foundation staff who are in attendance this evening. And next, it is my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Foundation Interim President and Sa CEO, Sammy Pakrifke, to share a few words and help us start this evening tonight. Sammy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, and Zena, for inviting me. I just want to say how wonderful it is to see so many people interested and engaged in the Individual Artist Award process. Um, I've only been at the foundation a few weeks as interim president and CEO, but I actually have a long history with the foundation. I was on staff um, quite a few years ago, and my time at the foundation back in the day coincided with the beginning of the Individual Artists Awards program. And so I feel really honored to be here and uh, share the space with all of you as the program has developed, as it's grown, as its impact has continued to affect so many people. And I'm just really happy to see this program so vibrant. So thanks again for inviting me. And I really look forward to hearing more about what's happening. Thank you, Enzina. Uh, thank you so much, Sammy, and thank you for your long-standing support of the Individual Artist Awards Program and Arts in Alaska. We are also joined by some wonderful guests and community partners who, if you logged on early, you'll recognize from the slideshow. When I call your name, if you're present, please wave. Nina Gron with the Alutic Museum. Jess Pena with the Fairbanks Arts Association, Holly Hobson with the Girdwood Center for the Visual Arts, Tracy Ferguson Hayes with the Juno Arts and Humanities Council, Katie Oliver with the Kodiak Arts Council, and Laura Ellsworth with the Southwest Alaska Arts Group. Thank you all so much for your work supporting artists, makers, and culture bearers in your communities, and for helping us share information about IAA across Alaska. Before we jump into the program, we want to go over some Zoom housekeeping. This program is being recorded, and so you can keep your cameras on or off per your comfort level. We ask that you keep your mics muted and use the chat or raise hand function to ask questions during our Q&A portion. Closed captions are enabled, and you can access those by selecting the More or CC icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions along the way, we encourage you to post them in the chat or to send a private message to one of the event hosts. We will be collecting and gathering those questions to address them before our time ends together tonight. 
And now I'm going to start us off by sharing my screen so we can start an overview to the Individual Artist Awards. All right, just a quick tech check. Zuli, um, can I get a thumbs up if we're good to go? Fantastic. All right, so we only have a short time together today. And over the course of our time together, we're going to do a really brief overview of the history of the Rasmussen Foundation and the Individual Artist Awards Program. We'll hear from Ernestine Hayes, the 2021 Distinguished Artist, who we are so excited to have join us this evening. Ernestine is going to share her reflections on being an artist, her practice, and some um, tips for uh, other artists. And we'll go over components of the application, share some tips for success, and then we'll have a question and answer period with myself and my colleague, Karen Lowell. The Rasmussen Foundation began in 1955 when Jenny Olson Rasmussen created the foundation to honor her late husband, E.A. When they arrived in Yakutat at the dawn of the 20th century, no one could have imagined the extraordinary impact they and their descendants would have on Alaska. Jenny Olson was a Swedish immigrant, as was EA, and they arrived in Alaska as teachers and missionaries. They loved Alaska and their impact spanned across areas like law and banking, development, government, teaching, and civic leadership. In 2000, their son Elmer Rasmussen left much of his personal fortune to the Family Foundation, carrying on the Foundation's legacy. The first grant the Foundation ever made in 1955 was for a motion picture projector to um, a Presbyterian church in Wasilla for $125. The mission of the Rasmussen Foundation is to promote a better life for Alaskans. And this is achieved through a variety of grant making programs. The foundation supports arts and culture and health, social services, housing, and more, in addition to the promotion of philanthropy. The foundation acts as a catalyst for change and, and celebrates and embraces diversity within Alaska. In addition to supporting individual artists through the Individual Artist Awards, the foundation invests in arts and culture through supporting arts and culture organizations and communities. So what is IAA? The Individual Artist Awards is a competitive arts grants program that began in 2003 as part of a comprehensive strategy to support arts and culture in Alaska. At this time, the board gathered arts and culture leaders from across the state and asked them what the best way to invest in arts and culture was. Overwhelmingly, the response was to put money directly into the hands of artists. And that is what gave birth to the Individual Artist Awards and the three award types that the program recognizes. First, we'll discuss the project awards. These are $10,000 grants for short-term projects and up to 25 of, awards of these awards are given each year. Fellowships are $25,000 grants for one-year projects. These grants are a little bit more unrestricted and up to 10 fellowships are awarded each year. We'll spend some time talking about these awards and what distinguishes them from each other in a moment and the Distinguished Artist Award. This is one award that is given to one Alaskan artist each year for a lifetime of dedication, contribution, and investigation into the arts. And again, we are so lucky to be joined by one of the Foundation Distinguished Artists today. Now, we will focus on the project awards and fellowships during this talk, and these are one-year grants that come with professional development. And that professional development is to support the other side of the art practice that isn't creating the work. It's the part of the art practice that is developing a portfolio, writing those narrative questions, drafting and refining your artist statement, tips on how to talk with producers or galleries or museums or editors or publishers. And so that professional development supports that one-year grant you receive to pursue your art practice. And these grants are intended to support you as an artist as you build, make, explore, exhibit, write, record, research, document, and more. 
what you can do with a project award or fellowship is quite broad. These are Alaska-based and Alaska-rooted grants. And so artists have to be full-time Alaska residents. And we can talk about residency in, in just a moment as well, and who are 18 years of age or older. So that leads us into who can apply for an individual artist award. Individual artists, makers, and culture bearers who are active in their practice as an artist. They are currently producing. Someone who might have an idea, a great idea for an art piece, but hasn't been active in their craft or hasn't been actively producing may need to refine their work just a little bit before they're eligible. In addition to individuals, artist groups or collaboratives whose practice involves more than one person are eligible. So these groups can be ongoing, they can be a dance group or a music group that has been together for years, or they can be a time-based collective of artists that come together for a project and will dissolve after it. Again, this is limited to Alaska state residents. So individuals, including all members of a group, must have been full-time Alaska residents for at least two years at the time of their application and intend to remain an Alaska resident at least throughout that grant period. This year, we will be requiring proof of Alaska state residency before issuing an award. So that residency piece and knowing if you, if you have a, a qualified established residency is super important. Again, all individuals, including all participating group members, must be 18 in years of age or older. So what that means is if there is a, a group with multiple ages and some of those group members are under 18, unfortunately, this isn't the right grant program for those individuals. Previous awardees are eligible to apply, but they must wait three full years from the completion of their grant period date before they can apply for another award. Folks who are ineligible are students who are currently enrolled in any degree seeking program related to the arts at any educational level. Um, so if someone is enrolled in a university course that is not arts related, that would not be an ineligibility. But if it was in the a genre or discipline of any arts practice, that would be an ineligibility, as would work that has been made while they were enrolled in that degree-seeking program. That was done under the supervision of a professor or instructor or course. And so we encourage artists who are newly out of a degree-seeking program to develop an independent body of work that wasn't done under uh, their academic year or under instruction. Any Rasmussen Foundation board or committee members, staff members, foundation contractors, panelists, or their families are ineligible. And then projects that are primarily academic or scholarly driven or that are client driven work. And by client driven work, we mean work that was done under the direction or contract or paid for by a client. And that could be a firm, a governmental agency, a school, a business, or otherwise. So this is work that is really individually driven and to support the individual artist or the group in their process. Award recipients from within the previous three years. So an example of that is if someone received an award last year, they would be ineligible this year and must wait that three full year wait period before applying again. And then individuals who are not full-time Alaska state residents or present in Alaska at the time of their application. We do have information on our guidelines that will help you define if you are an Alaska state residency and if you qualify for the residency requirements. We say that if you can qualify for a PFD, you are eligible for an IAA. So what is the purpose of the Individual Artist Awards? This is really twofold. It is to award grants that allow dedicated time and resources for serious artistic exploration and growth. Can these projects help an artist explore and grow and develop their craft? and then to strengthen Alaska's cultural resources. We know that when you invest in artists, you invest in arts and culture uh, overall. 
And since the beginning of the program, uh, grants have been awarded to more than 600 artists representing more than 54 communities throughout Alaska, and this grows every year. Uh, there are a variety of disciplines and ways of making and creating that are available to explore in the Individual Artist Awards. The foundation recognizes 11 distinct disciplines we won't go over all of those disciplines today, but we do have information and definitions of these disciplines in our guidelines. So we encourage you to check out our guidelines on our website. And each of these 11 disciplines are eligible in the project award category each year. So if an individual is interested in applying for that $10,000 project award, any discipline is eligible. Every other year, the fellowship disciplines rotate. So in 2023, there are only five of the five of the 11 disciplines that are currently eligible just in the fellowship category. And this year, that's dance and choreography, crafts, folk and traditional arts, literary arts and script works, and performance arts. The fellowships are also limited to artists working at a mid-career or established level. And we'll talk about career stages in just a moment. So mid-career or established artists in the year 2023 can apply for one of these five disciplines, but any artist at any career stage can apply for one of the 11 disciplines um, in the project award category, but one artist may only have one application in per grant period. So again, those three award types, project awards, $10,000 grants, up to five, 25 of those are awarded each year. And these are for short-term projects that can be done in a one-year period of time. What that project is, is quite broad. That might be creating work for an exhibition. It might be purchasing equipment for your studio or building your studio or attending workshops or conferences. If you're curious about what your project is and if it would be eligible, we encourage you to reach out to staff at arts at rasmussen.org. I'm sure one of my colleagues is putting that in the chat. And we can talk you through what your project concept is and if it would qualify for one of these awards. Now, the fellowships are those $25,000 grants. There are only 10 of those given in about half of the disciplines each year. And these are more unrestricted. And so these can be used for a uh, uh, quite um, a variety of activities that help strengthen an artist explore and develop their craft. It could be time to write a novel or researching different galleries and museums. It could also be to purchase equipment or to exhibit work, but it's an, a little bit more flexible in, in what uh, that project is that the artist is undertaking, but again, it needs to happen in that one year period. Now, the Distinguished Artist Award, we won't talk much more about that after this. That is that one-time grant of $50,000 of recognition for an artist who has dedicated lifelong investment in arts and culture in Alaska. It is selected by a nomination process, and that nomination process has now closed for this year. But we encourage you to think about established artists in your communities who have that lifelong contribution to arts and culture in Alaska, and we encourage you to nominate them next year, please check out our website for upcoming deadlines. So how do you identify what your career stage is as an artist? The foundation recognizes three career stage, emerging artists, mid-career, and established artists. Now, emerging artists are those who are in the early stages of their professional careers. They have already a developed body or a portfolio of work and a clear artistic voice. So an artist, again, that is maybe just starting out or um, is just beginning their art practice, they may need to refine their crafts just a little bit before being eligible to apply as an emerging artist. But an emerging artist's work has begun to take shape and it shows that there's a future path. 
A mid-career artist is someone who has a independent developed body of work and has made contributions through their discipline. Now, those contributions are also broad and, re and relative to the type of practice. It might be through exhibition, it might be through workshops, it might be through performance, but there is a progression of this um, uh, reciprocal community contribution. They've also showed steady progression as an artist and continue to challenge themselves and their practice. Established artists are those who have created an extensive independent body of work representing lifelong investigation and maturation of their personal creativity. And they demonstrate a high aesthetic level of artistic ability within their, within their uh, professional arts career. We do ask artists to self-identify. So when you uh, fill out your application, you will be asked to pick which career stage you feel most aligns with your work. And this is very important because when the panel looks at your work, they're also looking at the stage that you've identified. Um, so it's important to make sure that you're um, selecting the most appropriate. Again, if you're not sure where you fit, if you feel like you might be in between, reach out to staff. So who is the panel? Um, I heard our colleague uh, at the Alaska State Arts Council say this the other night during an event, and I thought it was just so wonderful. There are humans behind this panel process. And I think sometimes that, that gets a little tricky once you spend all of this work on your application and hint send and your application goes out to the ether. It's going out to humans who are, who are excited and impassioned about this process and want to see you successful. At the foundation, we gather a diverse panel of experts from across the country and sometimes beyond every year to review each and every application. As staff, we facilitate that process, but we are not making those determinations or those decisions. So this is an, an outside panel of working active artists, arts administrators or arts leaders that represent foundations or institutions, galleries, museums, um, those who work in academia. Um, this, this panel are uh, subject matter experts who are really invested in your work and in your success. And the panel is looking for the same criteria that we share with artists. And that is the artistic quality given your experience. Now that's why it's super important to make sure that you're picking the right career stage because the panel will look at the quality of your work based on your career stage. They're also looking at your creative accomplishments thus far. And this is why an artist resume that really highlights and reflects your work and what you've done and um, how you uh, what you've achieved so far is really important. We'll talk about resumes in just a moment. The impact this app, this um, project or this process will have on your growth as an artist. The panel wants to know why now, why this project? Why does, how does this fit in your trajectory as an artist? And how will this help you advance to whatever your next level is? This is a really personal process. So how will this project impact your growth um, as an artist? And then the completeness of the application. How thorough have you responded to those narrative questions? Have you written it in a way that you've communicated exactly what you're trying to say so that an educated but uninformed individual on your work can get a really great sense of what you're trying to communicate? Also, have you uploaded the correct documents? Is all of the required criteria included in your application? Sometimes if those components are missed, your application might not be eligible if base criteria is left off. So making sure that your application is really complete is super important. It's also important to acknowledge that the cultural appropriateness of your work and application and so we just want to acknowledge that the cultural that cultural appropriation is the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, artworks, images, etc., of one people or society by members of another who is typically more dominant um, uh, in that way. And this presents a power dynamic of the dominant culture. 
What we see in works that show cultural exchange and responsible creative collaboration is that there's free prior and informed consent, shared control over process and product, acknowledgement and attribution, and respect for cultural differences and reciprocity and benefit sharing. If you wanna learn more about cultural appropriation, we do have a great panel discussion on our YouTube channel called Considering Cultural Appropriation, and we encourage you to check that out. We also have resources in our toolkit on, uh, on this topic. Okay, next, it is my great pleasure to introduce the 2021 Distinguished Artist, Ernestine Hayes, who will share with us her experience as an artist and some tips of encouragement. So I'm gonna stop my screen share for just a moment while we pull Ernestine up on the screen. Let's see, oh, there's Ernestine. All right, hi, Ernestine. Hello, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for being here and I'm honored to have been invited to speak to you. I talk to you from Occoquan Territory, Juneau, Alaska, where my family has called home for seven counted generations. I was born in Juneau at the end of the Second World War. And for the first several years of my life, I lived with my grandmother in the Juneau Indian village while my mother was in and out of the hospital for tuberculosis. Every summer, my grandmother would go to Hawk Inlet and work at the cannery there. And we usually took a barge around Admiralty Island to the other side of Hootsnoo And um, one summer though, I remember I don't remember the circumstances, but I remember that we took a plane and it was my first time ever on a plane. And it was one of those float planes. And I remember the water washing on the windows and I thought we were going down into the water and I, I was excited and frightened. And I still remember that very first time I was ever on a, on a plane. I also remember the first time I ever left Alaska. I was eight years old, so it had to be about 1953. And my mother signed up for a Bureau of Indian Affairs program and sent her to Tacoma where she learned how to type and how to do shorthand at a business college. We lived there for about a year with my uncle Eugene and my aunt Melba. And I still remember the first time I was ever on a freeway and we were on a two decker bus and that I'd never been on a two decker bus before. I'd never been in on a freeway. That was long before the Egan Expressway. And I remember turning the corner and feeling like we were going to tip over. And that was my first time out of Alaska, my first time on a freeway, and the first time in a double-decker bus. So we went to Tacoma. My mother learned how to type and do shorthand, and we came back to Juneau. And um, in Juneau, I began, I was, we were nine, I was nine years old when we got back to Juneau and everything was fine for just a little while, but it wasn't too long before I began to act out the predictable social expectations of a young native girl who um, my mother wasn't married. I never knew my father. I didn't have a father role model. My grandparents drank. We were still in poverty. We were poor. And it was pretty predictable how I would begin acting. And that's what I did. 
I quit school in 10th grade. I, I got into a lot of trouble and I got sent away. And the first time I got sent away, they sent me to Haynes House up there in Haynes. And um, I still remember the first time I had cornbread. I had cornbread for the first time when I was at Haynes House and I used to dream about having more cornbread and hope that we would have cornbread on the menu with melted butter and syrup on it. And I still remember when I had cornbread. My mother though, after I went back to Juneau after the second time I was sent away, um, I was burning up the town. I quit school. I, I just wasn't, I didn't know how to act. And my mother got pretty fed up and took me to California when I was 15 years old. And I stayed there for 25 years in California. And I came back to Juneau at the age of 40. It was a difficult trip for me and I was happy to come back home. And just as I had um, come back home at 40, I'd always said, even though I never finished high school, I'd always said one of these days I'll go to college. And so at the age of 50, I signed up for college. I ended up going to Anchorage for a Master's of Fine Art in Creative Writing and Literary Arts. And I came back to Juneau and began as a part-time adjunct teacher at the University of Alaska Southeast where I had earned my bachelor's degree. The second year that I was um, teaching part-time as an adjunct at UAS. The second year, Sherry Simpson, wonderful author, wonderful books that she wrote about Alaska. She invited me to um, join her in a, in, a, in a panel and do a public reading in Hawaii. And um, Sherry had been my advisor at, um, at the creative writing MFA and um, suddenly she was a colleague of mine and I was um, excited at the idea, but um, sadly I told her I, I, I can't go, I can't afford it. Um, I can't even afford a, a um, taxi to the airport. I was living in, um, in a in trailer park here in Juneau that I had proudly purchased. I was raising um, two of my grandchildren and um, I, I couldn't go. And Sherry told me about something called an Individual Artists Award. And I had never heard, heard about such a generous program before. Um, that was the very first time I, ever even imagined that, that someone would believe in me and see my potential and, um, and so generously um, helped me go to Hawaii where I attended my first convention. I sat for the first time on a panel. I did a public reading. My book was in press, but not yet published. And I felt that um, someone had a lot of faith in me and someone believed in me. And it was such a gift. And I learned how rich that gift was because I felt valued. I felt seen. I felt like a writer. I felt like an artist. I was full of gratitude and I was full of determination to, to seem deserving and I was full of determination to feel deserving. I advanced at my job slowly at UAS. I remained there teaching and I moved from being a, a part-time adjunct to a part-time term appointment. 
and then from a part-time term appointment to full-time. And finally, I was put on tenure track and I gained tenure. And I um, eventually became a full professor. And now I am Professor Emerita from UAS. I um, became an Alaska Writer Laureate in 2016 for a couple of years. And I, my, my first book, Blonde Indian, was chosen as the um, inaugural um, selection for Alaska Reads. And under both those programs as a laureate and as the Alaska Reads recipient, I traveled all over Alaska. I traveled throughout the state. I carry and treasure all those memories and all the people that I met, the places where I left part of myself at such beautiful, wonderful places all across Alaska. And I, then I was fortunate enough to be recognized as a distinguished artist, a Rasmussen distinguished artist. And now I'm working on my next book. I'm writing, I'm writing now again. And all those good things that I just described all those good things were the direct result and made possible by that first generous individual artist award because it made me feel valued. It made me believe in myself. It made me know that someone believed in me. I felt valued. I felt like a writer. I felt like an artist. I felt seen. Individual Artists Awards sponsor your important project and they do so much more. We are part of a great Alaskan artist community. We are Alaskan artists. We are artists. We are seen. Gonna teach. Oh, I just want to pause for a minute to take all of that in. Thank you so much, Ernestine. It's always such an honor and pleasure to share space with you and to hear your story and your words of encouragement. We're so grateful that you could be with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gunnar Chish, and I can't wait to see who my next colleagues are. Oh, thank you, Ernestine. Um, before we carry on with um, the rest of the presentation where we're going to dive deeper into the components of the application. And then we'll get to that Q&A where Karen and I can answer some of the burning questions about the Individual Artist Awards. We want to take a moment just to have a little shift. Um, and so if your shoulders started sneaking back up towards your ears, rest them back down for um, a brief survey that we're gonna ask you to fill out. Um, we wanna hear from you. Every year we evaluate the program and we hear and take feedback from artists and that really helps us shape the direction of the program. For instance, I forgot to open up and say, not only is this the 20th year of the program, but this is the first year in over a decade that those award amounts have increased. And so, if you've applied to the Individual Artist Awards before, you'll notice that the $7,500 project award is now the $10,000 project award. And that $18,000 fellowship is now a $25,000 fellowship. So we always want to hear from you. Um, so in just a few moments, my uh, colleague Zuli is going to launch a poll. And in that poll, we're going to ask you the questions that you see on the screen. Have you written an artist statement? Do you have an artist resume? Is your creative practice represented in one of those 11? And what is your career stage? Once you finish that poll, we want you to put in the chat, we ask that you finish this sentence. Let's create more. 
dot, dot, dot. All right, Zuli, um, are we ready to launch that poll? Okay, so uh, Zuli's gonna launch that poll and just take a, about a minute or so to answer these questions. Yes, I, the poll is launched. Great, lots of answers coming in, fantastic. We're almost at, we're over 75% of respondees. We'll give folks just about 30 seconds to finish up, and then we're going to share these results live, at least report on the results. All right, Zuli, I'm going to turn it over to you. Do you want to share with us kind of what what our group is looking like today? Sure. Um, the numbers are adjusting slightly as, as folks answer, but um, for the first question, have you written an artist statement? Um, it looks like about 58% of you have and 42% of you um, have yet to do that. Um, and then the second question, do you have an artist resume? Um, that is equal, half and half. That is great. Uh, and then next question, is your creative practice represented in one of the 11 disciplines? Um, we have 94% say yes, 6% say unsure. Um, and then the last is what is your career stage? Um, and we have 56% are emerging, 23% um, are mid-career, 4% are established and 17% are unsure. And I just wanna take a moment to say, if you are um, ever unsure about anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to arts at rasmussen.org. We would love to help you um, uh, answer those, any questions that you have. So, so please don't hesitate for that. And then also um, the toolkit has been mentioned a few times. Um, and in the toolkit, there are um, sample artist resumes, which you can look at. There are um, tips on how to write an artist statement. There are um, tips on grant writing. There's tips on how to prepare work samples. There's some videos. So that is a really great resource um, if you haven't looked at that. Um, and then just to plug the two workshops that we have coming up. Um, we have one on January 26th for first time applicants. And then we have another on February 2nd for more seasoned applicants. And in those workshops, we break apart the individual components of the application. We do some peer to peer workshopping um, and we kind of dig a little bit deeper into those um, parts of the application that you'll need to apply. And I will, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna turn it back over to Anvina. Awesome, thank you so much, Zuli. And thank you all for participating. Again, we are constantly looking at ways to improve the program. And so we really appreciate your feedback. Um, before I, I move us through kind of the application step by step, I just want to share some of the beautiful let's create more that are coming through the chat. Um, I'm seeing let's create more. Let's create more meaningful experiences with our art. Let's create more community art studios. Let's create more opportunities for minorities' voices to be, be heard. Let's create more connection. Let's create more beauty. Let's create more variety. I wish I could just read through all of these, but we don't have time. So I'm going to pull us back to um, talking about the individual artist awards as we start to get closer to that Q&A. So start thinking about those questions you have. If you want to jot them down, you want to put them in the chat. Our colleague Lisa is collecting questions that come in. So we want to make sure we can get to any questions that you have um, in the time we have together. So there are four main components to the application, that artist resume. Uh, and this is different. We're going to talk about what an artist resume is. It's different than a career or, or work resume. Not that art can't be your career, but very different approaches to um, an artist resume. Your artist statement, that's your overarching artist statement, not a statement specific to your project. We'll talk about the distinction. 
a narrative or project plan. And we have a few key questions that are asked in the application about what your plan of focus is if you were to get a project award or fellowship. And then work samples. Work samples that demonstrate your work and give the panel an idea of the work that you intend to pursue with this project award or fellowship. We'll start with an artist resume. So what is an artist resume? An artist resume is a short document listing your key academic and professional achievements or community recognition or training or if you're self-taught. It is an overview of your accomplishments, your activities as an artist. And it's typically done in reverse chronological order, which means newest to oldest. We also, in our toolkit, Zuli mentioned, we have a few templates that you can just download and fill in. Now, this is going to highlight details of your relevant experiences. And this is really, again, relative to your practice. Every creative expression is going to be different in what experience is relevant, whether it's exhibitions or residencies. Oops. I got too excited. Um, exhibitions or residencies, performances, collaborations, mentorships, uh, workshops, guidance. It's, it's what are the activities in your creative practice. For the Rasmussen Foundation Individual Artist Awards, these are limited to one page. Now, so these are a highlight. You're targeting specific expertise. Some other grant applications or residency or opportunities, they might allow longer resumes, but for our panelists, we limit that to one length, and that's the amount that the panelists are going to read. So really condense that resume. It's not a CV. A CV is capturing all of your experiences. It's kind of like a history of your experience as an artist, but a resume is just really, you're picking um, different elements to highlight. So you want that to be work that is relevant to your practice and development. If it's not related to your art, it doesn't belong on your artist resume. We know that artists wear multiple hats. If you're also a pilot and an artist and being a pilot doesn't relate to your artist practice, that doesn't belong on your artist resume. If you're a pilot that captures aerial photos that you then paint, that might be relevant experience. But if it doesn't connect to your practice, that belongs on a different type of resume. Because it's one page for this application, keep it clean, succinct, consistent, and easy to read. And just a note that it's preferred that applicants upload a one-page document onto the application platform, but there is also a text box, that, box in the application that you can fill out and type. So Uploaded one page is preferred, but you can also write in um, uh, your accomplishment, activities, training, et cetera, right in the application. Now that artist statement, again, this is the overarching who, what, why, and how of your art practice. This speaks to your passion. This speaks to what you're doing, how you're doing it, and the why behind what you're doing as an artist. This gives the panel an insight into your unique voice as an artist and what makes you different in your art practice. So this is something that you want to be an overarching statement, not a statement about the work that you're proposing, but about who you are as a reader or who you are as an artist so that your reader will get a better understanding of what you're trying to do in your work, why you're doing your work, and how you're doing your work. So that narrative plan, again, that narrative plan is that set of questions that occurs in the application. You will first upload your resume and your artist statement. There will also be a box similar to with the resume that you can write your artist statement in. Again, it's preferred that you upload a one page artist resume. And then after those, you will be asked five questions. Uh, please provide a clear and concise overview of the proposal. This is your elevator speech. This is what your project is in just a few sentences. You have a limited word count here. The next question will be to dive deeper into what you plan to do if you get the grant, if you've applied for a project award. What do you want to do with that project award, with those funds? What's your big idea? 
Same with fellowship. If you get that, how will you focus that fellowship year? How will you focus that project year? This is your opportunity to get into the nitty gritty with the panel so they understand what it is you want to do. And then the next question is, how will your proposal advance or enrich your artistic career or development? It's a lot of words basically asking, why now? Why are you doing this project now? How does this fit in to your artist practice? They're going to learn about your artist practice from your artist statement. How will this help you move forward and how will this help you grow? Next, you'll be asked an impact question. Why is this work important to you, your audience, and your community? Again, this is where you can speak to your unique voice as an artist, your unique story as an artist, and it's the why. It's the why behind the work. And then every application, a project award or a fellowship will be asked to provide a timeline. We know that timelines are flux and ever changing and we're incredibly sensitive to that during the time we're living in. But the panel wants to know that you've given thought to this and that the project is achievable within that one year period of time because again, these are time limited grants. So these, again, can be estimations, but think about if you got notification of the award, which typically happens in sometimes mid to late June, um, what starts then? What happens with your project? It can be a full year. Your project can take that full year, or it could be a few months of really concrete work. So you don't have to fill out a 12-month long timeline. That timeline, again, is going to be relative to your project. Now, if you are applying for a project award, you will be required to submit a, ten, a budget that equates to that $10,000. So it's a flat grant. An artist can't apply for $3,500 of the $10,000 or $7,500 of the $10,000. It's a $10,000 flat grant. So your budget has to equate $10,000. And there's lots of different things that would be eligible in your budget. If you're purchasing materials, absolutely. If you're renting a studio, studio cost. If you're attending a conference, airfare and conference registration. If you're working with other artists to create a project, stipends to those other artists. The panel also really encourages artists to make sure that they're paying themselves within that budget. So think about that. Um, if you're curious about what could be in a budget or if you have project expenses and you're not sure they qualify, reach out to staff. Oftentimes there are so many expenses in any project that we forget about um, as uh, artists and makers. So if you're not sure if your project is a $10,000 project or you're not sure what expenses might qualify, just reach out to us. Something that we encourage people to avoid is not line item breaking out your budget and just having one line that says time. That does not give the panel an idea into what you plan to do. Now, if it's something like, I need time to write my novel, what happens during that time that this, this money is going to go towards? Is it expenses, costs, cost of living, um, support? Uh, what's happening during that time? So again, reach out to staff and we can talk you through that budget and, and help kind of sort out what those costs are. Now, you'll notice that fellowships aren't included in this because, again, those fellowships are more unrestricted and um, we don't require a budget for fellowships. So you won't see a budget in the application, nor the panel will see a budget. So fellowships aren't required to develop a budget. And each of these questions have word limits, and we know that we know the challenge of word counts, but because of the um, the this amount of a, of applications we receive each year, we have to put some word limits on these questions. So we encourage you to follow those five C's of grant writing. Make sure you're being clear, you're communicating to the panel what you want, how you want to be understood, that you're being concise, consistent, compelling, and complete. 
That consistency piece is really important. You wanna make sure that there's a through line from your artist statement that that connects and makes sense to the project that you're proposing. And that project is supported by the work samples. And we'll talk about work samples and what kind of work samples we accept in just a moment. So there are three main work samples that the foundation accepts. And these, again, are going to be relevant to your discipline. And, and we also, for some disciplines, we also allow for combined work samples. Uh, the three types of work samples we um, uh, accept are photographic images. So these are going to be photographs of visual arts or crafts or still images, still shots of live action pieces. Uh, we accept video and audio work samples. So someone who works in media or film or music, performance arts, dance, theater, anything that's live action, that's movement based, that might be a video sample. Anything that has sound based might be an audio sample. Um, uh, and then, of course, written work samples. So these are for literary artists that are submitting excerpts of fiction or nonfiction plays or scripts or poetry. Now, there are specific limitations and certain numbers of work samples or certain lengths of work samples that are allowed. We're not going to go over that because from the 11 disciplines, they all have different guidelines. So first identify your discipline, then go to the guidelines and find out what the work sample requirements are to make sure that you're in line with the number of work samples um, that you can submit or the length of video or audio that you can submit. And that's super important because if you submit something that exceeds the length of what is allowed, the panel isn't gonna know where to start and they're only going to read what is required. So if it's 15 pages of a written sample and someone is submitting a hundred page man, a manuscript and the panelist isn't going to know where to start and they're going to read 15 pages. So make sure you're presenting with your work samples the best package of your work so that the panel can understand that you can achieve what you are wanting to achieve in your project. So some tips for application success. Um, we always encourage artists to seek help and support. We say to ask two people to review your application and ask them to review it for clarity, cohes cohesiveness, and understandability. I always recommend folks to find one person who's either familiar with your work or familiar with arts and arts practice to review your resume or to review your full packet, your application packet, and then someone who's not familiar with you as an artist or familiar with um, or works within the arts and ask them to read it to see if it is communicating what you're hoping to communicate. We also encourage you to submit current work samples. And these are work samples that are done within the last five years. So if someone has a work sample that's older, say it's seven years or 10 years old, but they feel like that older work sample is really relevant to the project they're proposing, would it be acceptable to submit that work sample? Yes. However, in submitting that work sample that's older, you will want to provide a description for why you are submitting that work sample so the panel understands that you are currently working, you're currently active practice, and this older work sample is included for a significant purpose. Now, the description within the work samples is another opportunity for you to convey your art practice and your voice and your work with the artist. So when you upload your work sample, you'll be able to give some information about the year it was produced, the title of the work, and then you have a text box where you can describe the work. That gives the panel more information about your practice and who you are as an artist. We encourage folks to start early and stay on top of deadlines. Um, uh, we hear from artists that they've started this application multiple weeks before the deadline. The deadline is March 1st at 11.59 p.m. And even the best platforms can crash if there's a rush of traffic at the very end. And if you hit submit at 11.59 and your application doesn't go through until 
12 or 1201, it has missed the deadline. So we encourage you to start early and submit early. And before you hit submit, review your application, you can preview a PDF of your application before you submit it. We encourage you to do that, to make sure that all of your answers are there, your work samples are correct, you can see that you uploaded the resume and the artist statement, and those are the correct documents. It, every year, we um, have the unfortunate um, situation of reviewing an application that uploaded the wrong document by accident. They uploaded not a resume, but they uploaded a blank piece of paper. And that's a required document that makes the application ineligible. So review, start early, submit early. And if you are able to consider seeking out professional documentation, we know that's a barrier. We know that not everyone has access to a professional photographer or audio mixer or videographer or editor. Um, if you do have access, we consider we encourage you to seek it out. But if you don't, find someone you know who is the best person you know at taking photographs or are taking um, videos or who's the really great proofreader and have and see if they can support your work. In our toolkit, we also have um, steps on how to take really quality images with your iPhone. So um, if you can, uh, uh, if you have access to professional services, take it. If not, do the best you can with the tools that are available. We heard this next one from a previous project award recipient, uh, Kristen DeSmith, be brave and be bold and be specific. These are panelists that are very invested in this process. They spend a lot of time over several panels and several weeks learning about your work, but they don't know who you are as an artist. And what they know about you is what you provide in your application. So be specific and be bold and take risks in your projects. Follow those guidelines. Again, those guidelines will give you information about the discipline. So you know what discipline that best describes your work. That's also super important because in the first round of panel, there are three separate rounds of the panel process. In the first round, your application is being assigned to a panelist that has expertise in your discipline. So if you select the wrong discipline, your application might go to the wrong panelist. So make sure that you're following those guidelines. You also wanna make sure that you're submitting the right work samples and the right um, guidelines and formats for the application. So print those out, keep them on hand as you're filling out your application. Show the panel what drives you as an artist and tell them why you are passionate about your work. These are not um, reviews where the panel is just looking at your images or just working at your work sample. They're looking at who you are as an artist. They're reading your resume. They're reading your artist statement. They're reading your project plan. So make sure that you are expressing the passion in your work to a panel. And keep working and keep submitting. We know that receiving those notices of decline or not being accepted is really hard and that applying multiple times can be really challenging. But keep working and keep submitting. Not being accepted is not a reflection of who you are as an artist or a reflection that you're not doing great work that deserves to be supported. Every year there are more deserving artists than there are awards for. So we encourage you that if you don't get it one year, try another year. And that's not just to the individual artist awards, that's to any grant opportunity that comes your way, whether it's an exhibit or residency or another grant, keep submitting. It's also important to know that here at the foundation, our panel changes every year. So every year we are working with a brand new panel of artists and subject matter experts and arts administrators who are looking at your work. So there's fresh eyes, new eyes on your application every year. And again, we wanna encourage you to think about what is your why? What is your unique voice as an artist? What is the why behind your work? All right. That brings me to the point in our presentation where 
you can stop hearing my voice and we get to hear your voice. And so we're going to turn it over to you um, to address some uh, questions that you might have. Um, I'll just keep this up on the screen just for a moment while you start thinking about those questions. Some of the questions that we get a lot is that if previous artists who've received awards can apply, they sure can. But again, someone who's received an award, whether it's a project award or a fellowship, they have to wait three full years from the conclusion of their grant period. This is a new change within the last couple of years. So if you're on the on the Zoom and you've uh, received an award uh, years ago, it might have been a little bit different. It used to be three years from your award. Now it's three years from the conclusion. So that's, this gives a little bit more time in between applying again. Um, can artists apply for more than one more than one award in multiple disciplines? Unfortunately, not one application per grant cycle per applicant. So you can apply in your discipline. There's also a multi-discipline. So if you're working across different creative practices in one discipline, either a project award or a fellowship, either as an individual or a group. And yes, groups can apply. Again, they can be ongoing or they can be time-based. The Individual Artist Awards is taxable and we are not tax experts. So we encourage you to talk with someone who can support you in preparing um, your grant year and how to align that with the tax year. And um, unfortunately, if there is a member of a group that is under 18, so a youth, they, that group would not be eligible because every member has to be 18. All right. With that, I'm going to get out of our share screen and I'm going to um, uh, spotlight my colleague, Karen Lowell, um, so we can take some of your questions. And um, uh, I'm going to ask my colleague, Lisa, um, were there any questions that came in? Yes, we got some really great questions here. Do you want me just to read some off to you? Yeah, let's start with let's start with one. Okay, um, what suggestions do you have for emerging artists who may not have a lot of line items to put on their artist resume? Oh, that's a great question. Karen, do you want to start us off? I certainly will. Um, and Anzina had already talked about how this is why it's important to establish your career stage. So the panelists are going to recognize that an emerging artist isn't going to have a big, robust resume, they're not going to have lots of lines, but the things that you can include are any activities that have led you to the place where you're at now. So things like if you've attended a workshop or if you've had work at a craft fair, if you've had any kind of opportunity where you've shown or played or shared your work with people, any kind of experiences where you have learned from mentors, those are totally valid things to include in a resume. And also you don't have to type up the resume in that kind of form, you can just write a paragraph about, you know, your experiences, both, you know, training and places where you've, you've put your work. So, yeah, yeah. I would definitely agree. We want it to be accessible. So if mm -hmm. that resume template that it just feels like that's not going to be reflecting your background well enough, it's not the right platform, please use that text box. Mm -hmm. There were a couple, oh, should I go ahead? Sure, yeah, let's do one more. Okay. And then I might unspot us and bring us back to the full group. So if folks wanna raise their hand, we can hear from them. But yeah, let's do one more. Cool, okay, so I'll combine these. There were a couple of questions related to how money could be spent. Mm -hmm. And I'll just go ahead and say in the chat, in case you didn't see, it can be used for childcare and elder care. So that's, that's some things. And then the questions that came in what about everyday cost of living, such as housekeeping, things we really usually do ourselves, um, but don't have time to do your art? And then I'll throw in the other um, one, which is a little different, but could you use it to start a small business? Could you make a small, mm. could you start a small business with your project award? Mm. Ooh, those are great questions. Karen, do you have, do you want me to start or do you want to? Yeah, Sorry. you should, you should okay. address this. So the one question was about cost of living. Um, and that's kind of a yes-ish, 
right? I think it depends yeah. on what those costs are and um, how long they'll be. You know, we had a, a applicant who was taking time off to work on their art practice, to work on um, their project. And so they needed support with childcare. Um, they were taking time off work, so they needed to supplement. And those were eligible. Um, and certain costs of living can be eligible, especially if there's something, a gap that's being created because you are working on your project. But I think we want to be really mindful of not using other basic costs to fill that budget and to fill gaps in the budget. So um, I don't know, Karen, like, do you have any other? Yeah, I would, say, I would say you could include some of those costs, but I would not include those as the majority of the costs. You wanna have the budget support the project, the proposal mm -hmm. that you're including in your application. And, you know, just be judicious because the, the panelists will acknowledge that it's like your time is valuable and that it is an offset, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, don't include it as the whole thing. Right. And, I, you know, we've heard too, like, well, it's got to be more than time because all artists could use time, yeah. Yeah. could use that time. Karen, I think that's an awesome point. It's got to relate to your project. It's mm -hmm. got to be aligned with your project. Yeah. And then the second one was, can you use your project award to create a business? And, you know, that kind of cradles on commercial and client driven and what's the business. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's the business of art making, of selling your work, of selling an album, of, you know, giving workshops. That's very different than, you know, opening up a art store or a gallery where um, it's not supporting your individual creative practice. So I think it, it, it depends on what that nature is. Um, that's a question I think we'd want to talk with you more about. Yeah, and so absolutely. email us at arts at um, org so we can kind of flesh out what's the business behind the business. <laughs> Karen, do you have any? Ha well, there have been proposals where people are like, I would like to build a studio so that I can teach classes and I can be a part of my community, you know, and I can extend the space to others who want to also be creative. That's different than I, you know, I want to start a store or mm -hmm. I want... So it, it, it is a little, it's a little tricky. It's not a yes or no answer. It would be like yeah. case dependent. Yeah. And please just, you know, email us. That, that's what, that's what our job is. Okay. I'm going to unspotlight oh. us just so we could um, all be in group together. Okay. Um, Karen, what were you going to say? There are just a couple really great questions related to that question that just popped up in the chat. Okay. Um, eligible expenses for paying someone to create a website. Absolutely. Um, professional development workshops. Absolutely. You know, if that's part of your proposal. So professional photography, if yeah. you, if your project is to document your work, that is eligible or to work with a sound or audio engineer mm -hmm. or to work with a, a um, editor, those are all eligible. All right, I put us back in groups so we can all see this. Um, let's create more community. Um, it, we have those questions Lisa captured and we are happy to continue going through them, but we also wanna take some hands. So if anybody has a question, they wanna uh, raise their hand and shout out, we would uh, welcome that. If not, um, we'll continue with the questions that came in the chat. Lisa, do we wanna start one more? Um, sure. So here's a good one. Um, someone said, I paint in two different mediums with distinctly different styles. Should I choose one medium to submit as work samples or is it okay to show the variety? Which would be better? Well, I think that's a great question. And I think it depends on your project. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to show your diversity and to show your scope as an artist, but the panel is looking at the work samples, right? They're looking at that aesthetic quality based on your career stage or the stage you identify as an artist, but also how it relates to the project because they want, an, they want information that makes them feel like you can achieve what you're proposing. And so if the work samples are too disparate, they, it might give them pause that 
this project is a different direction and your work samples don't support it. Um, but if your project is kind of copying that you work across these different um, uh, different types of painting within that practice, you want to continue more of that, then I think it, it would be appropriate to share that. When you're also thinking about your work samples, think about it as a portfolio that you are presenting. And usually the panel is going to start with your first work sample and then go down. So what is also the visual story that you're telling the panel by those work samples? Um, Karen, do you have any thoughts to add? No, that's that's good. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any hands. So <laughs> Lisa, let's just keep them coming. Um, someone had asked about um, kind of the competitiveness. And so, you know, is it is it true that they were they were wondering about if you are uh, applying in a that some disciplines? Am I can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that some disciplines um, uh, may not get any awards, and they were wondering. They've heard that. Is that a true thing? Are there sometimes that there's no awards in certain disciplines, and would that be based because of the quality of the applications, or is there something else that's related to that? That's a really great question. And so there are eleven disciplines um, that are recognized, and we really work with the panelists to make sure that there's a good cross section of representation within the awards across disciplines, across regions, across makers. Um, and sometimes we don't get applications in every discipline. And so if we don't receive an application in that discipline, that discipline might not receive that. Well, it won't receive an award because there's no, <laughs> there's no application in that. Um, likewise, sometimes we might receive a few applications in a discipline, but those applications aren't as competitive yeah. as applications in another discipline. So it is true that some years there might not be full representation of those 11 disciplines. Usually, I will say that's because there either were no applications submitted from that discipline or there were few that when it came down to those difficult final conversations and they are very difficult, um, uh, a different discipline just um, uh, stepped over it. Uh, but the majority of the disciplines are represented every year. It might just be one or two that might not um, make it. This so is just kind of a follow up to that one, and that relates to applying for either a project award at $10,000 or a mm. fellowship at $25,000, and a fellowship might appear much more attractive because it's so much more money. How should an artist determine which one they should be applying in? Mm. Great question. Karen, do you want to? Jump in. Sure. I think I think you need to keep in mind that the fellowships are for mature established artists and mid-career artists, and they are much more competitive. And they're also for um, not a project per se, but for ex you know exploration. Um, just keep in mind that there are only 10 awarded every year. Projects, projects are really for a specific goal or intention or um, endeavor that you intend to accomplish in that year. There are 25 of them across all 11 disciplines. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a good question to ask yourself. And it really, I just keep coming back to, you know, what do you want to accomplish? What is your goal? What is your, what is your mission? What's your purpose for this? And that'll help shape your yeah. decision. And, you know, I will say there is some overlap in what that project is for mm -hmm. the fellowship. Like, it might be to build a studio that might be their fellowship year, which might uh, overlap into the project award category. But Karen, you're absolutely right. Made career established artist. It's much more competitive. There's only 10. And is it relevant and relative to the project that you want to undertake and to the stage you are at in your creative practice? And if you're not sure, email us, we'll talk you through your project and, um, and, and give you some feedback. It's ultimately up to you, but we can support you. All right, I see a hand up, uh, Fiona. 
Hey, thanks for hosting this. Um, I was just wondering if you're having trouble deciding which, uh, if one is having trouble deciding which category mm-hmm. one's art falls in, uh, which, if it's a better idea to apply in a less applied in areas mm-hmm. and which areas are least applied in. Yeah, that's a great question, Fiona. So, um, uh, you know, it's hard to sometimes think about strategy behind um, the awards. And we always say, present your best work, choose the discipline that best represents your work. Um, And there are more disciplines that every year receive the most applications Mm -hmm. in them. Visual arts, overwhelmingly every year, literary arts, um, music, music composition, um, folk and traditional arts. These, we get lots of applications. Those are um, more practiced, um, or at least those artists are more applying. Some of the categories that have had lower applicants are things like new genre or dance or choreography, even though we know there are fabulous dance and choreography artists in the state, um, performance art, uh, presentation interpretation, or um, sometimes even multidiscipline can be low some years. So um, uh, it's hard to strategize about that because there are three rounds of paneling. The first is panelists who are working within your discipline, review your application individually, and then discipline specific panelists. So panelists who are all working within that discipline meet together and review your application. And then the third round is that the full panel cross discipline is reviewing those applications. And so it's hard to strategize because what we've seen is that sometimes panelists from a completely other discipline become strong advocates for an applicant that's completely outside of their field. Um, so it, it, it's hard to answer directly um, because of the way that the process kind of shakes out. Mm-hmm. Um, so which also- discipline, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Karen. I would also add, it's like, don't try to shove your work into a discipline that is not appropriate. You know, we've had people, it's like, well, my work's kind of associated with presentation interpretation. The panelists will be able to to see that you're, you're not, you're not being honest. (laughs) It doesn't align. Yeah, Yeah. It doesn't align with it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I get a lot of imposter syndrome in all of my disciplines, so it's really hard for me to know which one I'm in sometimes. And Fiona, feel free to reach out to us because I know you're working in so many different genres, so feel free to reach out. We can kind of talk through what your project is and, and, and see what might you know, give you our feedback. Of course, again, it's your, <laughs> it's all your decision, but feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Right. We've got, oh, we've got just a few more minutes. We probably have time for one more question. I'm just seeing a lot of questions in the chat about the possibilities of what you can propose. So if you have those questions, you know, please reach out. It's bigger than you think. It's not just about doing a a single thing. So, yeah. Lisa, do you have a question that can close out our our question time? Um. Maybe kind of the Alaska angle. So these are Alaska, maybe Alaska residents. You know, these are these are um, individual artist awards for Alaska artists. Does the project need to be an Alaska project? Um, that's a great question, and it depends what the project is. And slash no, you know, <laughs> I, we had um, one of our uh, recipients last year, the Pipeline Vocal Project wanted to bring Alaska acapella nationally. So part, their work is rooted in Alaska, but they also wanted to travel nationally and share their work outside. That's totally Mm -hmm. eligible. Um, uh, uh, Working in Alaska with Alaska artists is is totally eligible, but it's not limited to that. Um, Artists also have residencies outside of the state in other countries. That's totally acceptable. 
It's about what will develop your practice as an artist, your craft, your group's craft, what will help you push that to the next level. And sometimes artists will want to exhibit out of state and that's totally acceptable as well if it's building their practice, if it's building their craft as an artist. And if someone's not sure, reach out to us. Okay. Oof. Thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to end with just a couple more information slides. Um, uh, if you want more information, please visit us at www.rasmussen.org. You can um, learn more about the individual artist awards. You can log in. If you if you don't, if you haven't already registered, you can register and apply right online. We do have some upcoming workshops we want to bring to your attention. If you want to learn more, if you want more hands-on support on January 26th next week, we're going to be doing a hands-on workshop for first-time applicants, applicants who have never applied before. We're going to do a step-by-step -step walkthrough of the application portal, and we're going to start workshopping some of those narrative questions. So uh, we're going to have peer review where you can work with other artists on drafting your artist statement or responding to a couple of questions that show up so you can get um, feedback from those uh, from your peers on how you're communicating your practice. We're going to do another workshop on the second, but this is going to be for seasoned IA applicants. If you've applied before, um, we're not going to spend as much time on that like applicate application 101. We're going to dive into workshopping those narrative questions, workshopping your applications. We also at the foundation offer, offer a early bird draft review by Valentine's Day, February 14th. So if you submit your application by February 14th, staff will look at it for, for um, eligibility. We want to make sure that your base criteria has been met. We're not going to do a content review or give you feedback on your project, but we can say you your resume is blank. It won't advance unless you upload a new resume. If you miss that February 14th, anything that's submitted after and by the deadline is as is. And our deadline to apply is March 1st at 11.59 p.m. Please don't wait till 11.59 p.m. Um, apply early and hit that submit button early. Uh, with that, we um, will release you to your evenings. We were so excited to share this time with you um, and hear about uh, what you love about art and community and what you want to create more of. And we are here so that we can support you in creating together. So if you have questions, please reach out to arts at rasmussen.org. Karen, myself, or Zuli are happy to support you and help you along the way. And again, to learn more, please visit our website where you can find a guidelines and a toolkit. Thank you all so much. Um, we look forward to your applications. Please take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good evening, everyone.